very beginning to get me to thinking about the possibility of coming to Canada and starting a church. God used him to establish a church in St. Thomas. We'll know more about that tomorrow, but he's come. He's going to come for a few minutes and challenge us again from the Word of God. You don't want to not listen to last night's message. I already got some text back. It was so, so encouraging and such a blessing to folks. So I hope you'll take advantage of that. Well, Brother Elstock, we've given you, we've left five minutes for you, so that's, no, take whatever time you need. God bless you. Pastor said my responsibility was to put everyone to sleep to have a nap before dessert. <laughs> what Pastor didn't tell you about this morning is that he had told me last night that he was going to be praying with a friend of his from Newfoundland at 6 a.m., and uh, he didn't uh, ask me to join them in prayer. He probably didn't want to ask me to get up and, uh, and be down over in his office at 6 a.m., uh, but I set my alarm, and I got up at 5.45 uh, just to, to splash some water on my face and be awake. And so I started wandering through the building. I didn't know where his office was. I figured he was probably going to be in his office. And so I wandered from their home through the building trying to find, and it was all dark, and no lights were on. And so I got my phone out and put my flashlight on my phone and I was walking through the building trying to find where his office is and where might he be praying. I came to a door and it had a sign on it that said something about an alarm. And I thought, well, he's already come through and he's in his office by now, so he's taking care of whatever that means. So I opened the door and walked through and I got about five steps and an alarm started going off. Beep, beep, beep at nine o'clock this morning. And I, I closed the door real quick in hopes that would turn the alarm on. And it didn't. So I tried to go back through the door. And it's locked from my side. So I'm wandering around downstairs with a flashlight with his alarm going off, trying to find, he's not down there. He didn't get up to pray at 6 a.m. Finally, I texted him on my, from my phone. And I said, I set off an alarm. By that time, his wife was up, getting him up to come and uh, solve the problem that I caused. And uh, lo and behold, when it was all over, I found out that he decided he was up so late last night uh, talking that he decided to sleep till 6 and pray at 6.15. And so I woke up the fire department, the trickies, and uh, the pastor's wife and my wife and... Uh, and they all even still talked to me afterwards. I was really surprised. So we started off this morning in, in rare fashion at 6 a.m. this morning. Let's see if um, we're going to read from Psalm 84. Uh, if uh, you have your Bible or have a Bible on a phone or if the guys can put it up on the screen. I want to read uh, from Psalm 84 with you for just a few moments. <coughs> this afternoon and talk about a great subject on an anniversary and that is I love my church. It was obvious last night hearing the testimonies and hearing people talk about New Testament Baptist Church that you love your church. And when I read Psalm 84, I think about how much we love church as God's people. And more importantly than that, why we love church. The psalmist opened up Psalm 84 and verse 1 saying, How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Now, God has always had a people for his, a place for his people to congregate. There wasn't there were not churches in the Old Testament. But God had established a place in the Old Testament where he called his people to congregate together. We think of the tabernacle for many years through the wilderness wandering and even after they arrived uh, in the promised land, the tabernacle was a place where they gathered. We think later where they built the permanent temple. And, and the psalmist is, is expressing his emotional attachment to the place where God's people congregate together to honor and worship him. He said, how amiable 
are thy tabernacles. How beautiful, how desirable, how much I love my church where God's people congregate together. He said, my flesh longeth, my, my uh, soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. He loved the place where God's people congregated together to be able to honor and worship God. But then, in the psalm, he expressed why he loved his church. What was it about that place where God's people congregated together that caused him to say, I long to be there. My soul fainteth. I just, these are em strong emotional words. To long for something. To be so captivated by something that I, I just feel faint. I feel lightheaded just thinking about how much I want to be there. And, and so I, I, I begin to ponder, what was it about that place for, for the people at that time that they gathered together? What is it about the place where we congregate together? The assembly of God's people. Why is it that God's people love church? And there are some reasons why we love church. And I, wanna, I want you to, uh, to take note of what God provides through church that is so valuable to me that I long to be there. I love church because of what it provides or what God provides through church for my life. I want you to see what, what God provides through the place of God's people congregating together. The first thing I want you to notice is that the congregating of God's people provides an opportunity for my thirst for God to be reflected in that place. You say, well, why would you say that? Well, verse number two, when the psalmist said, my soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord, my heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. You see, here's a cause and effect. The cause was... The psalmist said, I cry out for God. I want more of God in my life. That's the cause. What does that cause effect in his life? He says, because I have such a thirst in my heart for more of God, I love church. Amen. Church is a place where the level of my thirst for God is reflected. You know, some people don't think much of church. You know, that's kind of a nice thing. You know, if I can fit it into my schedule, I'll try to catch a service here or there. And, you know, I, I kind of... I, but then there's some people who plan their schedule around the church calendar. I, I, mean, I mean, the church is the place that is the, 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 the foundation, and then I arrange my life around it as far as other things that I do. Why? Because I'm so thirsty for more of God in my life my, my thirst, my heart, my soul cries out for the living God. And because of that, I find church to be amiable. Amen. And I long Amen. and I faint over being at church. So one of the things church does, it kind of identifies, it kind of gives me the opportunity to reflect how much I love God. And how thirsty I am for more of God in my life. He talked here about the courts of the Lord. He said, my flesh cried out for the living God. I'm sorry, let me back up a phrase. He said, my soul long gave and fainted for the courts of the Lord. Now, if you were to go to Israel, to visit Israel, and, and, and uh, visit Jerusalem, and go up on the temple platform, you would find the platform that uh, once had the temple built on it, and that platform would have been the courts of the Lord. You would go to the south side of that platform, and you would find some stairs leading up to that platform. Those were the stairs where the rabbis used to meet with the ones they were training and mentoring. They were the very, they are to this day, the very stairs that Jesus Christ walked up at 12 years of age and his mom and dad came back and found him there, and he was meeting with the rabbis. Those were the courts of the Lord. What did they do in the courts of the Lord? 
Well, there's a lot of things they did in the on the courts of the Lord, in the courts of the Lord. They used to have choirs and 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 instrumental lesson, and they used to sing and praise God. There was a vibrant music program that Israel had that the Old Testament talks about. There would be rabbis, and a rabbi always had some talidim or some 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 individuals that they were mentoring. And you would find a rabbi with with a, a few individuals generally a, a few men around him that he was mentoring. And you'd find another rabbi over here with a few men that he is mentoring and he's teaching them the word of God. You would find over in this area, the treasury where they had the big trumpet shaped brass offering plates or offering vessels. And they would come and they would present to God their tithes and their offerings. There were all kinds of things that were done on the courts of the Lord. And the psalmist seems to have been away from Jerusalem. And he's coming back to Jerusalem. And he's getting more excited the further he walks. If you were to walk from Jericho up to Jerusalem, it's quite a climb up to Jerusalem. And as the pilgrims would approach Jerusalem, they would get more excited and more excited and more excited at every step because they were going to church. They were going to the place where God's people congregate. They're going to go to the very courts of the Lord and there's going to be music and there's going to be offerings and there's going to be teaching and there's going to be all kinds of things happening. And he had such a thirst for more of God that he said, I long for church. I love church. And my excitement about church is a reflection of the reality of my heart crying out for God. Those whose hearts don't cry out for God can take church in stride when it's convenient. But when you have a hunger and a thirst for more of God, oh, you love church. You love church. You love your church. There's a second thing the church provides. And in verse number four, I'm uh, sorry, verse number three, verse number three, the psalmist said, Yea, the sparrow hath found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself. And the psalmist noticed when he got up to the courts of the, uh, the Lord, he noticed the buildings there on the courts of the Lord, the, the, the temple and all the outlying buildings there on the uh, temple platform, and he noticed that the birds w had built nests uh, on the buildings, you know, in, in corners on a little ledge here and there. He would see that the birds had built nests around the building. You know, sometimes in, in our day today, we'd say, man, is there anything we can do to get rid of these pigeons? <laughs> they, they make such a mess of the building. <laughs> what can we do to get rid of these swallows? But that's not what the psalmist thought. He saw that the mother birds found it desirable to build the nest at the house of God. Why did she want to build her nest at the house of God? Verse 3 tells us that the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my king and my God. He said the birds build nests at the house of God because they want their young to be birthed at the house of God. I was looking at the, at the diagrams there on the back table, and I, I, or back wall. I don't know how carefully you've looked at that, but if you look at the, the middle one that's kind of down below the other two, if you look at some of the, the rooms and what's going to be here and there, look close. You'll find a maternity room <laughs> for your ladies to come to church and birth your babies. No, no it's, it's not really back there. Don't go back here. It's not really back there. But that's what the, that's what the psalmist is saying. He's, he's using an illustration of these pesky birds building their nests on the, on the temple, on the house of God, so that they can lay their young, lay the eggs and birth their young at church, right down at the altar. Yeah. At thy altars, O oh Lord. You know why? Because church provides for us a place to raise our kids. Church provides for us a place where we can raise our young. Our world's a messed up world. Our schools are messed up. 
Our entertainment agencies are messed up. Everything's messed up. How can our kids have a chance to have a moral foundation, to have an understanding of truth, real truth, not truth through the eyes of the woke culture, but real truth? What chance do they have? This is their chance. Church provides for us a place where we can birth our young and raise them up. We teach our children at home. Church can never replace the home. It can never take the position of the home. Deuteronomy 6 says to the moms and dads, these things shall be in thine heart and thou shalt teach them to thy children. Mom and dad must teach. They must pass their faith to their children. Ephesians chapter 6 says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. In the Old and in the New Testament, God lays the responsibility square on the shoulders of dads and moms to pass their faith from their life into the life of their children. But church is a place where our kids can hear and Say, you know, that's what my dad taught me last week. That's what my mom was talking about last week. And the church reinforces what dad and mom do seven days a week. The church can't do one or two days a week what a family can do seven days a work a week. But the church can reinforce. The church can say amen to what dad and mom have been teaching at home. That's the value of the place where God's people congregate in both Old and New Testaments. It provides us a place to raise our young in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You know, last night when we were looking at Ephesians chapter 1, I I skipped over a couple of verses, but I think they're appropriate in regard to what's happening in our world today. When, When Jesus Christ, the second member of the triune God, when he solved the problem that we could not solve, The Bible goes on to say that having saved us, he abounds toward us all wisdom and prudence. In Ephesians 1 and in verse number 8, wherein he hath abounded toward us all wisdom in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. And he goes on to talk about how a part of God the, whole, the, the, the son working in our lives to solve the problem that we can't solve. God saves us and then he teaches us. He makes known unto us what is true. Do you, do you understand the ramification of that? Do you know you know more about Canada's future than Prime Minister Trudeau knows? Because God makes known to his people what's coming down the pike. Unsaved politicians can only see what they can see in the present and they can only plan and hope for things in the future. But God's children who studied the word of God and who've read the book of Revelation, we know what's happening tomorrow. We know where we're going as a, as a uh, human race. We've read the last chapter. We know how it ends. God makes known unto us according to his wisdom and understanding. We've got a private, you know how how some people, you'd have to be in the family to really understand this. Well, yeah, that's that's right in spiritual things too. You got to be in the family to understand this. Because if you're in the family of God, God makes known unto you through his word what the future holds. You know, that's a benefit to our young people who hear all this gender stuff and all this woke stuff and all this craziness in our culture today. How do they know where truth is? Church is the place where we get to instruct our children what real truth is and what the future holds. And that is so valuable. You say, why is that valuable? Well, back in Psalm 84 and in verse number 4, he says, Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. Now notice this. They will be still praising thee. I want my kids to walk with God, not just when they're 9 and 10. I want them to walk to God, with God when they're 18 and 19. Amen. I want them to walk with God when they're 25 and 26. 
I want them to walk with God when they're 40 and 41. These families who love church because it provides a place for their family to be raised in truth, those children will be still praising thee. Still is a future word. They'll still be praising God in the years to come when families teach their children and bring them to church and let the church reinforce and build the reality of what they taught in their home. And those kind of families will produce children that will still be praising thee. I don't know about you, I got 14, my wife and I have 14 grandkids, and that's 14 little boys and girls are in schools, and then a couple of in college, and growing up in a woke culture, a crazy world. And I'm not only concerned about what they do today, I'm concerned with what kind of people they're going to be 20 years from now. And one of the values, one of the provisions the church provides for us, it provides for us a place. My mom and dad loved church. After they got saved as adults, once mom and dad got saved and they started raising us in a good Bible preaching church, we were there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival meetings, missions conferences, youth activities. I mean, we were there, 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 and there. They loved church. And they passed that love into my two brothers, my sister and myself. And every one of us still to this day, in our 60s and 70s, love church. Because mom and dad passed it to us and took us where we could still be praising him in the years to come. Listen, the reason I love church is because I love God. And my relationship to church is just a reflection of my thirst for God. And I love church because it's a place where my kids and my grandkids are being raised to know truth. And to believe truth. And to make life decisions based upon the truth of the word of God. Oh, that's valuable to me. That's why I love church. Let me show you a third provision that church has for us. This kind of person that he's been describing, verse number five, uh, verse number five, blessed is the man whose strength is in thee in whose heart are the ways of them. He kind of is summarizing what he said in the previous verses. This kind of man who has found his strength in God, who has found his strength in church, this kind of man in whose heart are the ways of church. It's from his heart. It's not a put on. This kind of person. Now notice what happens in the life of that kind of a person in verse number six. Who passing through the valley of Baca. What's the valley of Baca? Well, that doesn't mean anything to us today living in Canada, but Back in Israel, that meant something to those people of that culture and generation and and geography. The Baca was a tree that grew in arid, dry climates. And a valley of Baca was a desert place of weariness and and, and a lack of water. And and it was a place of of, of discouragement. But this kind of family, who has a thirst for God, who loves church... Who's in whose heart are the ways of church. This kind of family, when they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a well, and the rain also filleth the pools. When they go through tragedy in their life, they turn that arid, dry, horrible situation into a refreshing rain. Who find in the challenges of life That there's hope. You see, this kind of family who loves God and who finds the congregating of God's people a place where their thirst for God is revealed and they can raise their family. It's this kind of family that when they have tragedy, I'm 70. We've probably all lived long enough to know that everyone has tragedy. Everyone has trials. 
I was asked by a man, at a, I was candidating to become the pastor of a church. I, I didn't become a pastor of that church, and I ended up starting the second church that my wife and I planted that we just retired from. But before we started that church, I, I thought we were going to take an existing church, and we were, I was candidating, and, and it was in a question and answer in the evening, Sunday evening service, and a man asked the question, said, what traumatic experiences have you had in life that would fit you to be our pastor? I thought that's one of the most wise questions I've ever heard asked of a prospective pastor. How has God broken you to where you learned through the tragedies of life that God is real and his comfort is real? What is it that's happened to you that has broken your life down and put you in a, in a valley of Baca where everything is going wrong? And in that valley, you learned that God could be trusted and God could comfort you even in that valley. I told him about the night my dad died when he was 50 years of age, suddenly and unexpectedly. And I got, got a call from my wife at 11 o'clock at night on a Saturday night. I was in my office putting the finishing touches on Sunday morning's sermon. And my wife called and said, Mike, you need to come home. Your dad just died of a heart attack. I remember the tragedy. I remember crying all night long. I remember getting up the next morning, preaching the morning service over at Bible Baptist in St. Thomas, dismissing the children and telling the church family that my dad had died just 12 hours earlier, that I'd be leaving to go back down to the States to bury my dad. And I can remember Glenn Cross, a farmer, not a man of many words, not a man who, who was up front of anybody. He was a farmer that was quiet and reserved. And he came and he took me by the hand and he shook. His whole body shook. And with tears streaming down his face, he said one sentence. He said, Pastor, I know how you feel. Because we had just buried his dad just a few weeks before. And I knew, he knew what I was going through in that valley of Baca. And you know what? At church... I found in Glen Cross what I needed at that moment. You see, the verse goes on to say they go from strength to strength. They go from a source of strength to a source of strength. It's, it's a beautiful picture. He said this kind of family, this kind of person who thirsts for God, who the church is a place to raise their family, they find their strength in church. It, it, that their heart knows the ways of church. They are better equipped to go through the valley of Baca because when they come to church, they go from one source of strength to another source of strength to another source of strength. And when their heart is broken and their life has fallen into pieces, they sit down with a church member who says to them, I know how you feel. That happened to me 20 years ago. And they cry together and they pray together. And they go to another church member. They go from strength to strength. You know, when our life is falling apart, that's when we need church the most. Why is it that anyone would say, I feel so bad, I can't go to church? That's the moment I need church. Why? Because church provides for me a resource base of people who love me, who will cry with me, who will counsel with me, who will help me. Church provides for me support in hard times. And then there's one last thing that church provides. I love church because I want more and more of God. I love church because I want a place to raise my kids and my grandkids. I love church because when my life falls apart, I need a group of people who love me in spite of what's happening in my life, who will cry with me and pray with me and help me in the valley of Baca in my life. But there's a fourth provision. The psalmist said in verse number 10, For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. 
I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. You see, church provides for me opportunities to serve God. He said, I'd rather just be a doorkeeper. I'd, uh, pr preacher, can I stand at the door and just welcome guests when they come in? I just want to be a doorkeeper. Just, just give me something to do. Give me an opportunity to serve. Give me a place to minister. Give me a place, an opportunity where God can use my life to be a help to other people. I would rather just be a doorkeeper serving at God's house than to go out there and party in the tents of wickedness and live a worldly, ungodly life. I would rather just have an opportunity to serve my God. And the church provides for me that opportunity. You see, I've got a choice how I'm going to live my life and where I'm going to live my life. And this psalmist said, I'm going to make the choice to live my life at church. And he ends by saying in verse number 12, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Because it's the person who's hungry for God, who raises their family in church, who finds the church a place to receive help when their life is falling apart, and who gets busy and teaches classes, sings songs, uh, is an usher and a doorkeeper, and just serves God at church, that man shall be blessed by Almighty God in his life. Do you love church? Amen. I love church. Church is so much to me because of all the tangible blessings it provides for me throughout all the stages of my life. And on your 44th anniversary, as you celebrate the life of New Testament Baptist Church, it's a great church to be in love with. It's a great place to enjoy God's blessings in your life. Father, I'm grateful for church. I'm thankful for every church that is pre preaching the truth of your word. I'm thankful for this church and for what you're doing in this church with this group of people and how you're blessing their lives through your church. And Lord, I pray that you'll especially bless them as they celebrate their 44th anniversary as a church here in Hamilton, Ontario. In Jesus' name I pray.